Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are truly God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we would ask you to work in our lives tonight. As you know, each of us needs, Lord. Speak to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm starting out very excited because G and I don't, I don't know what songs G is going to be singing. Am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, and this is not, this needs to be up. Because our, our topic tonight is where abiding in power. So we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and as I was, right before uh, we started worshiping, I was thinking, you know, we, we say we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? But when we come to the Lord, or before we come to the Lord, we have some really tweaked ideas of especially the Father and the Holy Spirit. What are, just help me out a little bit. What are some things that you thought about the Father God before you knew what he was really like? Angry. Strict. Strict, okay. What's that? He wanted to punish. He wanted to punish, okay? Impersonal. Impersonal. And now we know that as Jesus came and said, You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he is every bit as loving as Jesus. In fact, he loved us so much that he sent his only son. What about the Holy Spirit? What are some things you thought about the Holy Spirit? Scary, didn't understand. Didn't get it. I didn't even know he existed together. Okay. Or he's some essence, you know. Yeah. 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 The father, the son, and the holy ghost. Didn't even know that. Didn't even know what to do. Okay, something back there. He thought he was Catholic. He thought he was Catholic. Didn't get it. Good. Okay. So tonight, we want to talk about where abiding in powers, because the verse that we're going to be talking about is about the Holy Spirit. But I kind of wanted to talk about that because I just love that you did that song, because we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, and we see the role that the Father has. We see the role that the Holy Spirit, uh, that Jesus has. But what is the role of the Holy Spirit? My... Uh, grandson Ty, when he, when he was two years old, he was sitting at our counter eating lunch, and, and all of a sudden he got, he got down and he walked over to the cupboard, and you know, most grandmas have a little box in the cupboard that has a candy in it, you know, and he picked up a piece of candy and walked over to me, and he said, Grandma, can I have this candy? And I said, Ty, Mommy's here. Go ask your mommy if you can have a candy. So he walks over to his mommy, and he says, uh, Mommy, can I have this piece of candy? And Kelly said, uh, what a lot of moms would say, finish your sandwich, then you can have a piece of candy. Well, Ty walked right back over to me and he said, Grandma, can I have this piece of candy? <laughs> and I said, Ty, what did your mother just say? And this little two-year-old looking at me goes, she's not talking to me. <laughs> I want to say tonight, I'm talking to you. You know, that we say, we believe, the Bible declares very clearly there is a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So. What are we supposed to do with this third person of the Trinity? So we have from 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. So let's add what John wrote just a few verses above that in 1 John 2.20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So both of these verses, they follow verses about deceivers, about false teachers. The false teachers at the time were called Gnostics. They had crept into the church teaching that they had these special revelations. 
and their knowledge of God was superior. And see, when anyone creeps into the church and they, they say they have special revelations and you see that it's off, we shy away from any kind of revelations, any kind of works, don't we? Because we see someone that's off and we rightly say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But unfortunately in the church, we have said that about a lot of good works that the Holy Spirit wants to do. So John's counter to that, or his protection against false teaching, was twofold. We've looked at one, the Word of God. Verse 24 reminds us to let the Word of God abide in us. Other verses today, our verses today, excuse me, reveal the other, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the end of verse 27 tells us to abide in the Spirit. Healthy Christian living is both abiding in the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when either one or the other is emphasized, we miss out. So healthy Christian living is abiding in the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, verses 20 and 27 both contain a word of contrast, but... Unlike those who would deceive, all believers have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. At the moment we surrender our lives to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and dwells in us. That happens to all believers. He abides in us all the time. Now, notice, he doesn't reign in us or rule in us all the time. That's optional. That's an option. And it's not his option. It's our option, and that always amazes me, that how much the Holy Spirit works in my life isn't up to him, it's up to me. I heard a quote one time, we have as much of God as we want, and isn't that true? At the moment we surrender our lives to Jesus, he comes inside. And he's always available, though. See, we, he, our choice for how much control he has, that, that's up to us. And that option is ours. But it's like having Google Home or Alexa. How many of you have that in your house? No. I have one. Uh, and, and what's interesting is she's always ready to give me an answer. All I have to say is, okay, Google. And, and she's right there to answer my questions. But I cannot benefit or function, get an answer from her, unless I request that something from her. And the Holy Spirit is always there, just like my Google Home. Unfortunately, Google Home, sometimes when I ask a question, she'll say, I'm sorry, I'm not programmed to answer that question yet. God doesn't do that. You know, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. Or God is not like that. But he's always available. Now, the rest of verse 27 tells us, that we do not need that anyone teach us. Now, one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives is teaching. The Bible records a whole lot of teaching by men anointed by the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, we have the resources of knowing what is truth and what is not. We're not dependent on teaching to tell us what is true and what is a lie. However, the more truth we put into our lives, the easier it is to identify what's wrong. See, that comes from studying and teaching. Through the Holy Spirit, we've been given discernment to be able to tell what is true and what is false. You know that feeling when something isn't just right? You may not even be able to identify exactly what it is, but especially if you're a new believer, but you gotta check inside. So, so there's something wrong with that. And what John is saying is you don't need to tell someone to guide you in that area to tell you if something's off. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you, and you can tell when a teaching is wrong. And as we talked about earlier today, often the lie is mixed with truth. If, if we are abiding, the Holy Spirit will give us a sense that something is off. The Holy Spirit will speak to our spirits. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 says, but God has revealed them, God's wisdom, God's truth, to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. 
Everything the Holy Spirit teaches is true. The Holy Spirit not only helps us discern lies, he helps us discern truth. I have this message that that I love to teach about Jesus' hard teachings that he taught while he was sitting on the Sermon on the Mount, taught the Sermon on the Mount. And one part is based on what he says on Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And I think you would agree with me when we read that, the flesh goes, "Mm mm-mm, you know, that one's hard. But I found that when I sit on this and we teach on this, and you'll get a piece of this tomorrow morning. I I don't know if I should tell you that. You probably won't come if you think I'm going to teach on on that scripture. But there begins to be this turmoil inside as the Holy Spirit starts working on us. And the flesh is shouting, no, that's too hard. I've been hurt too many times. Well, something happens to our spirits. And when the word of God is exposed and and touched in our lives by the Holy Spirit, we start having that sense of, but I want that. I want to be like that. And see, that's the Holy Spirit inside of us. And John is reminding us that all of us have that sense of when we see something that is even very hard, we look at it and we go, but that's true. That's true. And that really is the best way to walk. The Holy Spirit leads us to the Word of God and to a deeper understanding of the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Christ. Anything contrary to that is just that. It's contrary to what God has for us. So I want to go back to the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night he sat with his disciples in the upper room, and they were bummed. They were bummed because Jesus was telling them, I'm leaving you. I'm going away. And he encouraged them with two truths. One was he reminded them he's coming back to get them, and they would get to be with him forever. And then the second one we find in John 16, 7. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart... I will send him to you. So the second encouragement was that he would send a helper to take his place until he returns. Now, Jesus spent a lot of time that night speaking about the helper or the Holy Spirit. And when we sit on that, we see he was excited about what he was telling them. The, the role that the Holy Spirit would soon play in their lives. And I, I think he was kind of whetting their appetite for his work and, and maybe especially the, the enab- enabling of the Holy Spirit. Because, see, Jesus didn't enable them. He could teach them, but how many times did they just not get it? They were clueless. And Jesus was telling them, it is to your advantage that I leave because if I don't leave, The Holy Spirit can't come. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit with us, in us, is better than Jesus alongside us. And part of Jesus' prayer the night he was betrayed was this in John 17, 4. Father, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. I have finished the work on earth that you have given me to do. And as Jesus promised, he was not going to leave us without giving us another helper. Now the word another, as it was used in in John 14, 16, says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Don't miss that. How long will the Holy Spirit abide with the believer? forever. Good girls. The Greek word for helper is paraclete. And I love that about the Holy Spirit. It it means one who comes alongside. And we see our God is so demanding sometimes. And and we think of, of God saying, you know, here's the right way to walk. Get over here. That's not our God. 
He sent the Holy Spirit as one who comes alongside, who walks us to where God wants us to be. And, and I love that he does that. He understands our weakness as he, as he does that. So he is called a paraclete. And he teaches us about all that Jesus has accomplished for us. Yes, salvation, but also love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and gentleness and comfort. See, it's the Holy Spirit that works those things in and through our lives. Jesus accomplished these things for us. The Holy Spirit works these things in and through us. So really, it's the Holy Spirit that is doing the work here on earth in and through believers. So that being true, would you not agree with me, that since we have this anointing, since we have the Holy Spirit available to us, it would be wise that you and I understand what we have that is available to us. He can't just be, I don't know, I don't want to mess with him. People say the Holy Spirit's weird. Jesus said, if I don't go, he can't come. I read a story of two men that went to Niagara Falls and they're looking at the, the power and uh, one said to the other, come and I will show you the most unused power in the entire world. And he took him over to the top of the falls and said, there it is. There's the most unused power in the entire world. And, and the other guy said, oh no, brother, the most unused power in the entire world is the Holy Spirit of the living God. And it's so very true. You see, you and I can do our day without the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we do, we've done our day in our power. We cannot, absolutely cannot do God things without God's power. I do a lot of counseling, and I've done it long enough that, that I think I wouldn't want to, but I think I could pull off a counseling session because of my experience and all that I've read, and the person at the end would go, thank you very much, that was very helpful. But I never want to settle for that. That would be settling for good when I could have the best. It would be settling for good when, when I could be settling for having holy and for each of us, every one of our lives, do we settle for a good, I made it through the day, I didn't do anything bad, when we could have done a God work, when we could have had something where God intervened and it was a holy day? Have you slipped into mediocre Christianity, not tapping into the resources God has provided for you? Do you lean on your own wisdom and your own experience? Maybe your walk is good enough, that what you say and do is good enough, but it's not God's best. And so have you settled for you? Have you settled for good when you could have had holy? To the two women that have had the greatest influence in my life have challenged me in the same way. And they both had said to me, listen to the Holy Spirit. One of them was within days of going home to be with the Lord, and I went to see her, and I just sat at her feet. and I said, what would you tell me out of everything you've learned? And she just looked at me and pointed at me, and she said, listen to the Holy Spirit. See, do we? Or have we been Christians long enough that we think, I can be good enough today. I can pull off this day in my own strength. I can even give people scriptures and give people wisdom in what I know? Or do we listen to the Holy Spirit? And do we listen on a regular basis? Recently, I was doing my devotions, and the only noise I was aware of was, was our refrigerator running. And if you would have asked me, Is there, are there any other noises going on in the house? I would have said, no, it's just the refrigerator. But all of a sudden, the refrigerator kicked off, and there was a still, small voice of the clock in the living room going tick, tick. And I didn't hear it before. It's not that we can't hear. See, it's not that God isn't speaking. It's that we aren't listening. And you and I are settling for good decisions instead of holy ones. I read a story about 
some job applicants in a telegraph office at the time of the, uh, when the Morse code was being used. And letters were spilled out in dots and dashes. And a dots, I'm, I'm told, is dot, dot, dot. They're fast, and a dash takes about as long as three dots. The Morse code was in the background, and it was spelling out something as these job applicants were filling out their applications. And what it was, the Morse code was spelling out was, if you understand this, come directly into my office. The job is yours. One young applicant was listening in the background, walked in, and got the job. See, the sound, the Morse code, was hearable and understanding to all of them. But only one listened. And thus, only one got the job. The telegraph office was looking for someone whose ears were attentive. And so was our Lord. Sometimes we put all these criteria on what it takes to hear the Lord or be spiritual. God just says, just listen. John says, you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he has to say. So who is the Holy Spirit? He's a person. He's been given titles of the promise of the Father and the Helper and the Comforter, the Teacher, the Most High, Advocate, Counselor, and so many more. So um, I want to stop right. I prepared a handout for you so that I wouldn't have to go through a lot of scriptures. So girls would, would pass those out and... Uh, I'll be going through some of those things, but they're mainly for reference for you to look back. Because when I started being challenged about the Holy Spirit, I I looked up every scripture in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is uh, a spattering of, of some of them. I decided I was going to put away what I'd learned in my Baptist upbringing. I was going to put aside what Pastor Chuck has said and just... What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? So if you would look at your list on the role of the Holy Spirit. Now he doesn't just impose all of these things on us. He makes them available to us. We have a part. So look at the, I think it's the fourth page of your hand out the response of the believer. Yeah, page four. The response of the believer to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we could summarize these verses, and it's very important to see all the things that the Holy Spirit does that we don't want to miss out on, that he wants to do in and through our lives while we're here. But I wanted to concentrate on the response of the believer for a little bit. So basically, I could summarize these things in in four different categories. Uh, First one is we are to walk in the Spirit. Secondly, we are to pray in the Spirit. Thirdly, we are to be filled with the Spirit. And fourthly, we are to desire spiritual gifts. Now, to be able to keep this handout a little smaller for you, I've not listed all the verses, especially those that call us to be filled with the Spirit and to desire spiritual gifts or several. But I want to look at, first of all, walk in the Spirit. If we walked in joy, joy would be the dominating emotion in our lives. Right? If someone says, wow, she walks in joy, you would look at her and say, she is. She's a woman that walks in joy. Well, we are to walk in joy, but we are to walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if we do this, he would be the dominating emotion in our lives, the dominating choice in our lives. We choose him when we choose to walk in the Spirit. Romans 7, 6 describes it as no longer walking in the oldness of the letter of the law, but walking in newness of the spirit. And the word newness is not so much new in time as much as it speaks of freshness or superiority. There are many verses that speak of putting off the old man and putting on the new. Serving in newness of the spirit 
is living the new life that God has enabled us to walk through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, Romans 8, 4 and 5 tells us that we are to walk in the Spirit by setting our minds. See the deliberate choice here. Remember our skit, you have a choice. We are set our minds on the things of the Spirit, set, choose. The same word is used in Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. To mind the things of the Spirit is to think like Jesus. That brings it back down, doesn't it? I mean, for the most part, you and I know what Jesus would do in a situation. And when we don't, we are to seek him. Lord, I want what you want. And the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. So to mind the things of the Spirit, thinking like Jesus, specifically to be interested in the spiritual rather than the flesh, to be occupied, and I love this word, to be occupied with the things of the Spirit. Notice the contrast that keeps popping up. We can't be walking in the spirit and still walk in the flesh. We do one or the other. Much of Galatians 5 teaches us about the result of walking in the spirit. Verse 16 says, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Think about that promise. I mean, don't you get so sick and tired of your flesh? Lord, I don't want to give in to my flesh. Help me. And we have this promise here, walk in the spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Or if you intend or purpose to live your life according to the Spirit, you will walk or order it so it will be true. A life that truly lives for Jesus purposes to order her days in a way that that will be accomplished. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we looked at it this morning. Uh, is the fruit of or the result of walking in the spirit is just what we want. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. By walking in the spirit, by purposing to choose him. So the Holy Spirit is given to each believer so that we can walk or live this Christian walk. He's given to enable us to do supernatural things, to do God things. And to do that, we must put on the piece of armor that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We can't walk as believers if we don't know how a believer walks. And we can't walk in that knowledge without the power to do so. So that comes from hanging out with the source of the power and depending on him, or what we've learned this weekend, abiding. And then talked about praying in the spirit. We're to pray as directed by the spirit or empowered by the spirit. We're to pray with the sensitivity to not only what he would say to us, but what we should say to him. The best way to pray what is on our hearts, asking him, Lord, guide me, show me, what's the best way to be praying right now for this situation? The word of God has revealed to us God's will. We're to pray according to that. And the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit, as opposed to praying according to our fleshly desires or according to our own thinking, our understanding. Romans 8, 26 and 27 tell us this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Many believe that the groanings referred to here and and praying in the Spirit is really praying in tongues. Now, praying in tongues is certainly one of the ways to pray in the Spirit. 
praying in tongues is, is setting aside the flesh and our, our mind and praying 100% the way God would have us to because our prayers are led by the Spirit. It's one of the ways. Besides Romans 8, 26, the other verses that speak of praying in the Spirit are found in June 120. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, look at how Paul used the term praying in the Spirit in 1 Corinthians. He said, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. I don't understand what I'm praying if I'm praying in a tongue. What is the conclusion then? He says, I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. So the gift of tongues is different than other gifts. All other gifts are given to edify or build up the body of Christ. Gift of tongues, we are told in 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies or uses any of the other gifts edifies the church. It is the only gift that can be exercised at our will. And it's the only one for our self-edification. Now, when I say at our will, um, you, I'd love for you to be able to come up to me and say, give me a word of wisdom on this one. You know, God may or he may not. But as far as speaking in tongues, we choose when we speak in tongues. We choose when we stop. We can go from tongues to English to tongues to English. No problem. And I'm, I'm talking about this because it has been so mistaught because sadly it has been so misused. And so what happens is people are, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, what do we do with all the scriptures that talk about it? What do we do with Paul, who we all want to be like, that says, when I pray, I'm going to pray in the Spirit, and I'm going to pray in English. If Paul found it to be valuable, shouldn't you and I? Remember James 4, 3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. How different really are our prayers than the prayers that, of those that James is writing to? See, we will never ask amiss if we're praying in tongues. We always hit what we're supposed to pray 100% correctly. That's important. And then thirdly, we are to be filled with the Spirit. One instruction found about being filled with the Spirit we find in Ephesians 5, 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And too often we focus primarily on the first part of that verse, the, the put-off part. I talked a little about this earlier. The don't part. And we... Ignore the command to be filled with the Spirit, that put-on part, the do part. And when we do that, all we are is sober people, controlled by our mind. So what? The world can do that. We're still ineffective as far as the work of God can be in and through our lives. See, the word fill is a verb. It's something we choose to do. We will talk about the prepositions that describe the three ways the Holy Spirit acts in a little bit, but being filled with the Holy Spirit is our choice to allow him to do what he does. The Holy Spirit fills, he comforts, he teaches, he empowers, he transforms. It's with uh, the Greek word pletho, which has a sense of influenced, supplied by, furnished by, when we're talking about the word filled. The Bible uses the word filled to describe someone being filled with envy. Same way as he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with envy. You know what that is? It dominates every, every thought, doesn't it? Or filled with confusion or filled with fear. Even uses um, this Greek word filled as a sponge filled with vinegar. So 
that gives us a kind of a, a sense of what he is saying when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit be the major influence in our lives. Now, this filling is not a one-time experience. It seems to be linked to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, yet it happens more than one time. We are to really be consistently filled by the Holy Spirit. And it's really a result of you and I choosing who or what will be the influence in our lives. And as I said, filled here is like the filling of a sponge, soaked, no empty or dry place. Controlled is a good definition, or wholly affected by, or influenced by. The examples we have in the book of Acts of believers being filled with the Holy Spirit are examples of them speaking, or witnessing boldly. Examples of them functioning in a power and wisdom stronger than their own natural selves. Holy Spirit dwells in all believers, but when he fills us, we are truly different, and others know it even more so than watching us be born again. It's kind of like the difference between uh, being described as sad or being filled with sorrow. A believer has the Holy Spirit, but a believer that is spirit-filled has the evidence of the Holy Spirit all over her. And too often we emphasize those put-offs in Christianity and and we settle for striving for this sinless life. And he calls us to put on, to walk in the things that he has for us, the things of the Spirit. See, if if I take this glass, I'll say this right, how do, how do I get the air out of this glass? Anybody got a suggestion? Maybe maybe I could dump it out. No? Air. Uh, you, know, you know what I'm going to do. So the only way that I can get the air out is to fill it. But as Christians, what do we do most of the time? Get the air out. Get the bat out. Get the bat out. Don't do that. Don't do that. And, and the Word of God says... Just be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, start concentrating on the Holy Spirit. And as I talked about this morning, it's like, I don't want that other stuff. I've got Jesus in my life. And so so the Bible tells us, be filled. Don't worry about, yes, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, waste, like we talked about. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Holy of Holies of the temple, there was a golden lampstand. And it was the duty of the priest to be sure the lampstands were filled daily with oil, never to run out. We have the accounts of the temple being rebuilt by Zechariah. And there were struggles, there were obstacles. And the angel of the Lord appeared, pointing to that lampstand. And he said these words, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. And we too must be continually filled by the Holy Spirit and continually dependent on him to do this work that he has called us to do, to be women of God in in all areas, functioning in his power according to his leading. We must, see, we must if we want to be all God wants us to be. If we don't, we won't. We will fall short. We will settle. settle. Being filled with or controlled by the Spirit indicates an awareness of him, a dependency on him, a looking to him, rather than our own wisdom, our understanding. So Galatians 5.16 reminds us, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The spirit-filled, spirit-controlled person does not have room for the desires of the flesh. And her desires themselves will be less. We talked about this morning that that needy hole has been filled with what we need the most. And then the response of the leader, the believer, 
is to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. Desire is really, really want them, but especially that you may prophesy. Especially now, Paul is addressing uh, the use of the gifts a lot in the church setting, and prophecy is is very valuable in in a church setting afterglow type situation. Spiritual gifts are to be desired. We're to pursue love first. Remember he said prior to this, the greatest is love. But it does not mean we are not supposed to be seeking the spiritual gifts of God. On the contrary, the more we love God and the more we love men, the more we want the gifts of God so that we can minister more and more effectively. The word desire means covet earnestly in a good way, to be zealous, ambitious for. The Holy Spirit gifts us in many ways, but these are the ones referred to in the Bible, and you can look at the next handout on the the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A spiritual gift is simply an enabling to do something that you couldn't do naturally. As a believer functioning in the gifts or gifts of the Spirit that have been given to you, you're walking in your part. God's specific purpose for your life and other believers are built up because of you and their gifts. Therefore, they can't be earned. We tend to think that people that function in spiritual gifts are are somehow they've done good things and they've earned the the right for God to grant more gifts. I can't find that in Scripture. A gift is a gift. But very often what you and I do, and not not only we, we don't think that God may want to gift us because we're not spiritual enough, but we're amazed when he gives someone that you know what their life is like. And, and we get really judgmental, don't we? Especially someone that speaks in tongues. You know, you watch someone speak in tongues, it's like, how can they speak in tongues? I know what they were like. They were gossiping last week. Now they're praising the Lord in a heavenly language. Why would God give them that gift? Because it's to strengthen our prayer life, and he wants them to pray more. He wants them to pray more effectively. And so we've got to get a hold of this, that, that their spiritual gifts are gifts. And we are to earnestly desire them. And the challenge can also be consistently desire spiritual gifts. In other words, have you functioned in a gift that is now stagnant in your life? Do you need, like Timothy, to be stirred up to use gifts? Jesus was so excited about being able to send the Holy Spirit to gift us. Do we have the excitement that Jesus had? Paul wrote this in response to correcting the mess the Corinthian church had made when they used the gifts. He didn't say stop it. He didn't say stay away from them. He said fix it. He said desire them. And yes, they've been terribly misused. But God's desire is we seek them. And we walk in them and we desire them. Take the gift of tongues. I I think tongues is the most controversial gift. Have you ever seen it done weirdly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of you have, you know. Should you stay away from it? See, I don't see that in Scripture. Have anyone ever seen anybody pray in English weirdly? (laughs) Yeah, all of us have. You know, soon we say, oh, well, that's weird. Look at that person praying. I'm not going to pray. That's weird. Well, if we don't do that when someone prays weirdly in English, why do we do it when someone does something weird using the prayer language? That's just someone being weird. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit taking control of them and making them do something that they wouldn't do. It's a weird person being weird. That's all it is. These are the signs of the spiritual realm available, are the things of the spiritual realm available to all believers. To walk in the spirit is to access the spirit, to live in God's way and his power, 
to pray in the spirit is much the same to seek God's way and his power. To be filled with the spirit is to live and pray in such a way that the Holy Spirit is dominating your life. It's your first, or he is your first choice of action. To desire spiritual gifts is to pay attention to how God wants to use you to encourage others. Now I would be amiss, or I feel like I would be if I didn't talk about the three prepositions that describe the uh, positions the Holy Spirit desires to take. Um, There are three Greek prepositions that describe the work of the Holy Spirit. First one is para, alongside. Before we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us. We've, we've experienced that. If you're born again, that, that wooing of the Holy Spirit, how he draws us to Jesus. So that, that's his first function. Secondly, the Greek word is en, we would say in, in. The act of the Holy Spirit, the moment we believe Jesus to save us. Uh, John 14, 17 says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. That's the para. He dwells alongside you. And he will be, future tense, he will be in you. And then thirdly, epi, upon. The coming upon of the Holy Spirit as promised by Jesus in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 8.14 to 17 says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John down to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had, fall, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, saved, but as yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them. And then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Does the inexperience of the Holy Spirit come when someone lays hands? No comes when we ask Jesus to save us from our sins. Now, as I said, this can't be the inexperience because uh, what happens when we receive Jesus as Savior is not when someone lays hands on us, although we do not need someone to lay hands on us for the upon experience, but we never need it for the indwelling After Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. After he was raised from the dead, before he ascended. And what did he say to them? He said, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then the very next verse, he says to them, he breathed on them after he was resurrected. And here he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, after that, when Jesus was leaving this earth and told them to go preach the gospel, then he added, Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Here's Luke's further account in Acts 1, 4, and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Let me give you another illustration. Uh, 
keeping in mind before I forget that that word for another is is uh, in John fourteen sixteen that Jesus promised when he leaves he will give us another helper who will be with us forever. Another is, is someone just like him. Now, if I again took an empty glass, and this is you, me, and, and the preposition of para of the Holy Spirit is he comes alongside. I got water. I got life. I got joy. Want it? Comes from Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I want it. Okay, so we go from the para to the, to the in. Now, because I don't want to mess up my notes or get the floor wet, the, the next step would be, as, as the role of the Holy Spirit is the upon, and that would be the Holy Spirit just pouring in us and over us. And that does not give me things like salvation. That gives you and I the power to walk this walk that God has called us to walk. Now, a lot would say that you get it all with the inexperience. And I truly believe that there are those people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit that have never sought the baptism, because I think a lot of times baptism in the Holy Spirit, that upon experience, comes from one of those real surrender times and the Lord just floods you. And, and I think sometimes we get so hung up on the terminology. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's Lord, come upon me, give me power, fill me, flood me, is what Jesus was saying to them. You, you have the Holy Spirit in you. But he was saying, don't you go out and witness. Don't you go out and do those things that I've called you to do without the power. Because it's pretty frustrating, isn't it? We burn out so much faster. D.L. Moody said, I would never go back to the way it was. And he was an incredible preacher before he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when he did, he knew there was a difference. And he said, I'd never go back. Joy Dawson said, I was forever ruined for the ordinary. I didn't want the ordinary again. Oswald Chambers, in the biography that was written about him, So then came the day when yielding absolutely and unreservedly reservedly to God on every point, he, Oswald Chambers, entered into the experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and passed to what he called years of heaven on earth. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said afterwards, does not make you think of time or eternity It is one amazing, glorious now. And again, it's no wonder that I talk so much about an altered disposition. He says, God altered mine. I was there when he did it. And I've been there ever since. Never wanted to go back. I recently was talking to someone who who teaches at a very large church, and she came out of Calvary Chapel, and she said, the church does not like to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in them, but we don't talk about them because they get people angry. And I said to her, that changed our lives. How dare we ever hold that back from our people when we are so different because of that? And see, I'm getting nodded heads like, yeah, my life has changed. And I don't know why people fight the gifting of the Holy Spirit the way they do because, yes, it's, it's been misused. But it's life-changing. And we are trying to walk this Christian life in our own strength. And it's too hard. And God, and God told, Jesus told the disciples, don't go. Don't go out there and try this thing until you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. For me, it's like the difference between regular television and HD or Blu-ray. You know, you can be watching regular television and and we think, ah, that's good. Being saved is wonderful, isn't it? And then someone comes in and goes, watch this. Whoa. 
and you'll never go back to watching regular television again. There are such riches in the spiritual realm available to us. And our, our text tonight, John's reminding us, we have the anointing. And this anointing that teaches us or quickens us is all that Jesus has for us. I remember the controversy about the gifts of the Spirit when my husband first became the pastor of the church we're now at. And some of the people said, we've been taught it. No one has talked to us about doing it. And I challenge you tonight. Is the Lord challenging you to do it, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk in the gifting and the anointing that he has made available to you? Because I think we're falling short. Let's say I decided to learn how to dance. Now, my education is in accounting, so I've learned, you know, if I want to learn about accounting, go buy a book. Shows you how to, how to do that. So I want to learn how to dance. So say I, I go to the bookstore and I buy a book. Shows me how to dance. I'm going to do this. So I'm reading the, the instructions and it says put your right foot forward. Okay. Now bring your left foot to the next to your right foot. Okay. Now move your right foot to the side. Okay. Now move your left foot to join it. Now twirl around. Okay. And I practice and I practice and I, I put the little feet down, you know, so I can step where I'm supposed to. And I think, I've got it. I'm doing it just like the book says. So I invite you to come watch me. And I say, come watch me dance. sit down in a chair just exhausted and I say, wow, you see that? I did it, I danced. And what would you say to me? <laughs> you forgot the music. <laughs> and so what I'm seeing that we do as Christians so often is, I love the word of God. I think you can tell I love the word of God. But too often we're trying to apply the word of God in our own strength. And we're dancing like that. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit is the music. And the Holy Spirit is the one that enables us and gives us the joy to dance. Now, the problem is, I combine the music with the rules. And I think, oh, I, like, I like the music. I don't need the book. I got it. And I start dancing without the book. And I start stepping on toes. And I start twirling around and knocking people over. And then what do you say? If that's dancing, I don't want anything to do with it. And that's what has happened in the church with the, the gifting of the Holy Spirit is people have set the word of God aside and just looked at the music and danced and have been offensive. And we've got to bring it back to what Jesus intended for us to do is the word of God empowered by the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, seeking all that he has for us. Will you pray with me? Father, would you speak to us? Lord, we have just seen so many bad things, and, and Lord, for some of us, we're just scared. Lord, you're a gentleman. You don't force anything upon us. You never have. You never will. And so for each one of us here tonight, I pray that you would come against the deception. All the things we've thought, all the things we've been told, and may we look at what your word says. And may we give you, Holy Spirit, the place in our lives that you intend for us, that the Father intends for us, and that Jesus intends for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.